um, by telling you about an event that changed my life that will apparently seem to have nothing to do with fog whatsoever, but I'll get there. Um, the event that changed my life was that I was doing a 10-day silent sitting meditation retreat. It was my first one, and to give you an, an idea about it, um, I'm sitting uh, about 10 and a half hours a day, and I had never sat anything like that before. It was incredibly intense. It was the most difficult thing I'd ever done in my life. Um, and the most transformative, too. That's not a picture of me at the retreat. That's later. There were no animals at the retreat. Um, so what happened at the retreat then, it was midsummer, July, uh, Central California. And those of you who know Central California in July, it was the foothills of the Sierras, it's hot. Uh, and I was also a latecomer to the retreat, so I was not able to get uh, a room in the dorms that most of the students had, the uh, air-conditioned uh, dorms. So I was in a non-air-conditioned tent, um, which was fine during the night, but during the day when you're looking for that brief respite in between periods of really intense sitting, all I wanted to do was lie down. But the inside of the tent was incredibly hot. So I was trying to think, okay, I couldn't talk to anybody, couldn't even look at anybody, but what can I do about my tent to make it better? So I was thinking, well, I have, I have some towels here for showering and things like that. I'll, I'll cover the tent with them, and I'll get a little shade. So I did that, and I thought, well, it's a little bit better, not much. Then I thought, okay, I will wet the towels. I'll pour them, I'll saturate them, and then I'll put them on the tent. And that actually helped. I had a modicum of relief. It was still hot, don't get me wrong, but there was a little bit of natural air conditioning, if you like, from the evaporative cooling that happens from the wet towels being on the tent. So now, these meditation retreats, I figured that out, I felt pretty good about it, but I was, the mind goes many places, um, and mine certainly was no exception. Uh, from there, I was thinking, wow, this is a really hot area, and there's a lot of water around here. I was thinking about Monterey, where I live. Uh, by the way, there's a, there's a tent. Um, but Monterey, where I live, is not so hot over the summer. As a matter of fact, as many of you know, it's kind of like San Francisco. It's, it's one of the coldest seasons ever anywhere, it feels like Monterey in the summer. We have fog. But we, we, and, and so the, on my mind was the fact that we had fog, but also in Monterey, we have constant water issues. Look, we're looking at desal plants. We're looking at figuring out ways to get water from here and there and everywhere. And I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be neat if we could get the water from that fog? And the funny thing was, I was thinking about this, this very hot place. There's no fog there. But that thought crossed my mind because I was doing this meditation. My mind had to go somewhere, and that's where it went. So then I was starting to get these delusions of, wow, I wonder if ever, anybody's ever thought of that before. That must be a new and innovative idea. Wow, maybe I'll be famous. And you know, you're supposed to be present when you're meditating. <laughs> that was a little bit far from being present. <laughs> but I went there anyway. Um, and so one of the first things I did when I got back to civilization was to do a little bit of internet research. And I found out that, indeed, I was far from the first person ever to think about getting water from fog. <laughs> I don't even need Beryl to help me figure this one out. <laughs> um, matter of fact, the Bible wasn't even the first one. There were, there's evidence of civilizations that lived um, all, all, uh, in the country that we now call Chile uh, 12,000 years ago that uh, were experts in water management that created their middens in areas that are known for having intense fog. So it was believed that fog was used throughout history uh, for uh, various purposes. And I can give you many other examples, but I'm going to move on and tell you that. So I thought, all, okay, all was not lost. I was just done meditating. I wasn't ready to just say, oh, I'm, I'm giving up. I mean, and I realized you don't have to invent the wheel to be innovative. Nor do you have to reinvent the wheel to be innovative. <laughs> but what counts as innovation is knowing what wheels have been invented, whether you're using internet or other means of research, and then applying them to a new situation where they haven't been applied before. That's innovation. So maybe something like that could happen with the fog. So this may look to many of you like Central California. It is not. It is actually Central Chile, the same place where a lot of fog activities have occurred throughout human history. Um, Chile is a pl parts of Chile have incredibly intense fogs, but very little precipitation, which makes this region so important in that this is uh, Fray Jorge National Park, and those trees that you see there are, uh, on those plants that you see, are completely, almost completely, 98%, uh, gr they grow from fog water. There's almost no precipitation. So this is a fog forest, and it's so important that it's, it's a national uh, monument in Chile. It's a very important location. And there's other ones like it, 
but it, it's an example of how important the fog is in some ecosystems, including our own here in Monterey. But in Chile, then, there was a lot of research that happened with regards to fog. Um, a lot of interest in fog, as you can imagine, from the population in Chile. There's these two individuals here. Uh, we're, they're trying to figure out how to get water from the fog. Same thing I was trying to thinking about, too. They're talking in, in Spanish. They're saying, are we beginning to make the most of the fog? That's the translation of what they're saying. Well, uh, the uh, academic institutions of higher education in Chile came up with uh, a lot of research projects to look at fog. And this is a really interesting one. What you see there are nets that are surrounding very complicated geometric structures from which the fog can coalesce and form larger droplets and then fall onto the concrete and then be collected in a reservoir for, for use later on. There's a lot of research done. And this actually mimics the water collection mechanism of a leaf. So there's a, there's a little biomimicry going on in this early design. And later on, um, a nonprofit, and they were my first connection to the fog world, called FogQuest, um, determined that some of the best ways to collect fog are with very large sails, let's say 40 square meters, 30 square meters, you'll even see some larger ones shortly, that, on which, that are oriented vertically to the wind direction, on which the tiny droplets of fog will coalesce and then drip down into the trough that you can see at the bottom over here, and then drip into a, a storage area. For, for use later in human consumption or animal consumption or whatever they want it for. There's fog gardens. People grow vegetables and other things based on fog. Here's another shot of the uh, setup. In, this is in Guatemala, one of the locations where FogQuest, and the mission of FogQuest, by the way, is to install fog collectors in regions where the fog water would be useful for, for people who have no other water source or who have limited other water sources. So it's a very humanitarian pursuit. And they have these large uh, storage areas here, as you can see. And you may think, wow, you get a lot of water from fog. Will this solve our water needs? Well, let's think about it a second. Um, I didn't give you any numbers, but a uh, typical American United States citizen will use 100 gallons of water per day. And this is not just drinking water. This is water for washing. This is water for flushing the toilets. This is water for watering your garden. This is water in the washing machines. This is water that we're using for all sorts of purposes. An acre of corn. Um, agriculture is also an incredibly large user of water in, in any society, but certainly in ours. One acre of corn for one growing season will use, as you can see, 600,000 gallons of water. That means that if you could put all that water on that acre, it would be two feet deep. That's how much water it takes to grow corn, from which maybe you can get 150 bushels, 200 bushels. Gives you an idea of the amount of water it takes to do what we do. So can we use fog water for human consumption? Possibly, but I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, this here is something called a standard fog collector, and it was designed by uh, researchers at FogQuest, including Bob Schemenauer, one of the pioneers in fog collection. And this here, up here, is a, a certain type of a mesh that's actually, I have some samples of, if somebody could maybe pass this around, you're welcome to just um, take a look at that. They're the same, so one, you know, we can pass them around. You can see what that mesh looks like. It's, it's a plastic mesh, but it is a, it is a na international standard mesh for fog collection. So everybody uses that mesh so that we can compare our data on how much fog water I'm getting here to how much they're getting in Yemen or Eritrea or Chile or anywhere else where they're collecting fog. And they're collecting fog all around the world. So the water, it's, it's a fairly simple design. The water drips down the mesh into the trough, down the outlet tube, and it can be used for something. I have, since this uh, meditation retreat in 2004, that's what started my fog research career, if you can believe it. So I'm a researcher at, at CSU Monterey Bay uh, in, in my spare time. And one of the things I do is set up standard fog collectors to measure the amount of fog water we're getting. Maybe we can use the water for something. Maybe it'll just give us more insight into the fog. I'll tell you a little bit more about the research in a second. But I have four collectors here in Marina, California, near CSU Monterey Bay's campus. And there's three down in Big Sur. And here's a picture of the deployment of the, uh, one of the fog collectors in Big Sur, not far from a pic or other pictures of Big Sur that we saw earlier with Julio's presentation. And then here's a, a picture of myself and, and my dog uh, at one of the fog collectors in Marina. And w one of the things that's interesting about water, collecting water from fog, if you look at the blue, th this represents about one week's worth of data from two sites in Big Sur. You got the blue data and you got the red data. Now, the blue data are from the higher site, and they're only separated by about two kilometers. And one of the fascinating things about this picture is that it shows the huge variation, the spatial variability in the amount of fog you collect. This here represents 44 gallons over a one-week period from just a one-meter square fog collector. And by the way, the fog collectors look something like this, except this is a smaller version of it. 
Now, what can we do with all these fog data? This here represents a satellite image taken from a sensor called a MODIS sensor. One of my research areas is with NASA Ames. And what they're looking at is, is fog a possible determinant or a way to measure climate change? How do we know that? Well, how do we know whether it could be? Well, we have to be able to get a lot of fog data. So satellite images provide possibly one way to do it. Notice this is the Salinas Valley here, and this is the fog coming all, all up there. These four fog collectors are in fog. These ones aren't. Now, if we can validate these satellite measurements with the in situ measurements that I make, then we can perhaps show that, yes, these are, the satellites are indeed measuring fog, and then we can make worldwide measurements of fog that can provide some indication as to whether the amount of fog is changing over time. But we needed a lot of data over a lot of time, over a good proportion of the Earth to be able to do that. But this is a start to that type of research. Now, fog uh, collection is, occurs in many countries throughout the world. This is just a few of them. Uh, and you may be surprised by some of them. There's quite a few in South America, but Eritrea, Yemen, I would have never known that those countries had a lot of fog, but they do. And in many cases, they had very little water, and they're being, looking at using fog to augment water supplies. So now I'm going to uh, show you a little video of uh, fog collection that's occurring at a, a Buddhist retreat center, or Buddhist temple in uh, Nepal. And as the movie uh, plays, I'm going to say a few words from Sri Nisargadharatha. The real world lies beyond the realm of our thoughts and ideas. We see it through the lens of our inner desires. Dividing into pleasure and pain, right and wrong, unconscious and conscious, inner and outer. To see the universe as it is, we must step through the net. But this is not hard, because the net is full of holes. So you're about to hear from um, one of the five residents who lives um, at this temple, and this collector supports all five and all the water needs. <laughs> One of the things I found fascinating about him is that he knew there's a lot of water coming, but he knew exactly how every liter is used. And I can ask us, me, all of us, how well do we know how much water we're using and what we're using it for? So this, to me, uh, perhaps stimulates with the awe and reverence of nature that the idea of collecting fog from mist and have that water collect in our hands might inspire us to new innovations, not of technology, but of consciousness, that may allow us to become better stewards for our natural resources so that we can better take care of, the world, of our world for our current children and for our children's future generations. Thank you. <laughs>